Hello everyone, I, uh, good morning. I'm sorry to wake you up early, all of you, but uh, because it's a weekend, so I would prefer to do this early in the morning so you have the rest of the weekend to do whatever you like. Are you able to hear me? Let me just uh, test it with you. Are you able to hear and see the screen right now? Very good. Okay, so we shall start. This is, uh, let's put a history, 35-year-old uh, thyroid aspirate. Now, uh, it is these sessions, again, dedicated for the people sitting the exam next week. So please, please, uh, I, I would like you to try to focus and uh, not to use your brain a lot, just use your memorization more. And uh, don't try to play any clever role here. Just try to understand what I am trying to achieve with this session in continuity with the previous session. Now, in the thyroid, as you all know now, and you should know by now, we have the thycular categorization, thy one, two, three, four, and five. Five is malignant, thy one is insufficient, and thy two is the benign one. And um, you have the thy three, which is the thy three F and thy three A. Thy3A never come in the exam, okay? So any borderline cases does not come in the exam. So this is uh, quite important to remember, yes? So there is no borderline cytology it will be put in the exam. So this is number one rule. Majority of cases historically that came in the FRC pass exam before about thyroid glands were either a benign, pure benign, with a lot of uh, large clusters, uh, of, of all groups of follicular epithelial cells, that is a thy2. The second most popular case is the, which is the most popular case is a papillary carcinoma, and the third one is the thyroiditis. Now, if you are being trained in any uh, uh, school of pathology, that thy thyroiditis is a thy3a, please delete this from out of your mind. In for the sake of the exam, the thyroiditis is a case that you should put it under the thy2 category, okay? And you should be able to diagnose it and don't try to say, oh, this may be, maybe not, maybe follicular, maybe not. This is not the, the right setting for this, okay? In real life, is different a little bit in the thyroid cytology. So let's start with this case straight away. So obviously, you go through the assessment, you will be given two slides again, one diff quake and one pap smear. So the problem arises for those who do not use to the diff quake and pap and they do H and E. But I think for the two conditions, which we are, we are talking about, the two most popular cases for the exam, the thyroiditis, thy2 or the three, and the, the, the papillary carcinoma, the, you shouldn't be struggling a lot. So, I am just trying to show you, look, there is a little bit of honeycombing here. So just be careful with that, okay? Be careful with that terminology, well-spaced out cells that they are kind of honeycombing, isn't it? Yes, but we, we carry on. So I'm just uh, showing you the, uh, uh, how, how, how the, the slide look like, and then, and then we will, uh, 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 just see what, what we need to, to write in order to, to gain the full score, okay? So majority of you now know the diagnosis, even without looking into the pap smear slide, you probably know the diagnosis, but of course you wanted me to go directly into a little bit of high power to look into more of nuclear morphology. Now, <clears throat> There is an important five rules I'm going to say, you and remember these five rules. So if you never know anything about cytopathology for thyroid, or you know everything about the cytology of thyroid, it doesn't matter. What I want you to remember, there are five rules you need to apply in the exam for any follicular uh, 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 aspirate, the aspirate, cellular aspirate that contain follicular epithelial cells. Number one, number one, that you need to look directly into the size of the follicular cells. 
yes, can compare the size to the background lymphocytes or the background uh, uh, red blood cells and ideally what you should see in the follicular neoplasm, either follicular carcinoma, follicular um, adenoma or papillary carcinoma, that if the cells are becoming neoplastic, they should now double or triple the size of the surrounding the lymphocytes and the size and the, of the red blood cells, okay? So just uh, just uh, pay attention to this rule because that rule will, will, will resolve a lot of issue for you because the neoplastic cells are twice as large as the normal follicular cells. And the normal follicular cells is normally the size of a lymphocyte. And therefore, you can start the equations by this, however, we have an exception, and that exception is the Hertel cell neoplasm, because the Hertel cell in the thyroid are naturally big, and they can be benign and they can be malignant. So that's not the, the, the setup here. The second things, okay? The second thing is that normally, normally the, the, the thyroid doesn't have a lot of cytoplasm, the follicles, right? So if you look into the normal follicular population, you should not see a lot of cytoplasm. So if you start to see the cells acquiring some cytoplasm, then you are in the neoplastic category or Hertel cell category. So you are trying to, again, to narrow your differential diagnosis. Now, the third thing, the third one is that when you look into a, a group to, to judge if you have what we call it, uh, a nuclear crowding or overlapping, which are a, a typical uh, a, a, or architectural atypical features, just that you, in, in the benign group, you might be allowed a little bit of nuclear crowding and overlapping toward the periphery, yes? So if I go to the periphery, to that group at the periphery here now, yes, you might find that they are crowded, they are overlapping, but it is at the periphery. So I probably won't take that. What I wanted is to go to the center, to the heart. Also, we felt that this might be a honeycombing group. Yes, at low power, it can be very deceiving, but the, the nuclear crowding and overlapping, which is a common feature that you see among the neoplastic lesion, either benign neoplastic or, or malignant neoplastic, like follicular adenoma, carcinoma, or um, a uh, papillary carcinoma, then what you tend to see that nuclear crowding and overlapping, and nuclear crowding and overlapping are architectural atypia, not cytological atypia, okay? The other things as well, which you need to, to then pay attention to, which will be number three, in the columns after those, the first two, which we said nuclear enlargement and then nuclear crowding and overlapping will be, the, the third point will be, how is the shape of this nucleus? Is it really round or is it going to become oval? You can see in this field that some cells start to become more ovoid. I wouldn't describe them as round, you know? Look at this column here. These columns, the cells move, looks more like an oval shape. And you know, you know, you can see the red blood cells are the round bit in the background, while the, the, the cells here are a little bit ovoid. And ovoid morphology is a feature that's usually very characteristic for the papillary carcinoma. A lot of people don't pay attention to this, but please, please do. The other things as well, that what people sometimes call it palisading of cells around the periphery of the group. Okay, look here. You can see this group here, which I am just putting in the center toward the edge of this group now. What you are able to see is, you can see that some people might call this uh, uh, as, 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 as a single column, but this, I wouldn't take that, you're right. What I would buy is this one, on, on this one, the one that's a little bit obscured morphology. Can you see the cells are be be becoming squashed a little bit, right? So the, the cells are squashed, becoming even more ovoid, and they are arranged like a pavement, you know, like the pavement of your street. So this is where they are. They are paving this group, and they form what you call it a, a um, sharp anatomical border. And this is a, 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 a terminology that we commonly use in the United Kingdom, sharp, sharp anatomical borders, which mean that you can draw 
with a ruler around some areas within the group. Not all of them, you see, not all of them. Some of them has got this, what you, some, some of you like to describe as papillary or papilleroid morphology. That's absolutely fine. But this is, this is, this is also uh, one, uh, an important feature here. You see the branching, the branching of the group. This is not a, the, the, the problem I, uh, some of you would like me to use an arrow. The problem which I have that I, um, the iPad doesn't give me that option. And this is why I try to put the group in the center and start to describe it. Okay, so uh, listen, this group is branching and the, the branching of a group is not a feature that you should leave lightly. Okay, uh, don't just rely on the fact that it looks popular or it, okay, no, what you need to, 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 uh, to see here is basically, you would see that there is a fibrovascular core going in the middle of this group and then you see the branching of the budding coming out of it. This is a very complex branching architecture. And this is what I would use surely to say that this is a papillary carcinoma. And this will be number four, this architectural papillary or papilleroid group that you see the papillary, but you also see the, the, the branching. You see these vessels running in the heart of this branch. And then you know that this is a papillary, uh, uh, proper papillary architecture. There is also uh, the new, you see what, I, what, you, what you are eager to, to talk about is the nuclear grooves and nuclear inclusions. The nuclear grooves and nuclear inclusions is only one point, okay? It's only one point of the five. There is also another thing that we call it a syncytial group. And the syncytial groups mean that it's a group. In order to see the group, you need to see or to go through um, three dimensionality so you can be able to alter the cells, right? So areas like here in the middle of the field now, okay? So I, let me just put it in the middle of the field for you uh, because we have a little bit of gap. Yes, very good, yes. So now you are able to see that group. You see, this group is very crowded, very overlapping. You cannot identify the nuclear details. For this group, in order to be able to see in between cells, you need to, to, uh, to go with up and down with your microscope. And this phenomenon tends to happen more with the neoplastic and tends to happen with the follicular carcinoma and the, follicular, and the papillary carcinoma. Yes, before you ask, we don't diagnose the follicular carcinoma in, in, in the exam or in real life. But we, we will have our doubts to call it follicular neoplasm or suspicious for nuclear neoplasm, of course. And this will be important uh, parameter, okay? And um, the, the other, so, so, so what I'm, and then, and then yeah, of course, the nuclear groups and inclusions, which I'm not going to go through, okay? That's not the, the context and not the right setting to, to start describing for you what nuclear groups and inclusions looks like. So this is a papillary carcinoma, okay? And then we agree then on this, that this is a papillary carcinoma, and then we are happy with this. Even, some, if, even if you get a lot of colloids in the background of this, which is the case that they sometimes have in the exam, they don't have a lot of colloids, but they have a moderate amount of colloid, and they bring it in and out every two or three years, the same case, the same case, the same case, yes? So they have moderate amount of colloid, but they have what I, we just talked about. You have enlarged cells, ovoid morphology, nuclear crowding overlapping, you have papilleroid morphology, and you have nuclear groups, and you have nuclear inclusions. And therefore, when you get all of those uh, uh, parameters, then ideally what you should even with the, don't try to then balance, say, oh, there are some colloids. Well, oh, I'm not sure. There might be thi too, might be. No, just apply the five rules, which we just talked about. Ignore the colloid for a minute. Okay, okay. So if you, your tradition to start with colloid versus cells in the papillary carcinoma, you cannot apply that rule because there is an exception in that rule in the papillary carcinoma 
because the papyrus carcinoma can have macrophages in the background, cystic background, and it can have colloid in the background, not only the sticky colloid, by the way, which the textbook are fond of. Yes, you can have thin and thick colloid, which we are trad the traditional one. So this is this is one thing that I wanted to, to, to I wanted to highlight on the thyroid, and um, and uh, this is um, to, to 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 just keep in, in mind that the the, the 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 what might you might face in the in the in the exam. The other things as well. Let me just go to another case uh, in in a second. So if you just bear with me while I'm switching between the cases because this iPad, so it's a little bit awkward to, 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 be, to go in between the cases. So I will um, take you to, the, uh, to another example. Let's uh, me just make sure that this is the example which I wanted to show you. Yeah, we will go through this example now and we will have a look and see what, uh, how we will be able to, um, to go through that, okay? Uh, yes, you are allowed to have some follicular architecture. So there's a question, say, can you have some follicular architecture in papillary carcinoma? Yes, you are. If you look into any papillary carcinoma, you will find follicles sitting in between the papillary groups. It's not all papillary. So you are allowed, but let's not go through the whole paper. You, you, you will have in the exam, you don't diagnose follicular carcinoma on a, a predominant follicular population, okay? You, you only diagnose it on the predominance of, uh, of um, the, the, uh, what we talked about is the, um, um, the papillary architecture, yes. So this is the, you need you need the architecture to be correct. What I wanted to show you in this slide is two facts. This is another aspect for my thyroid glands. Okay, regardless what the age, they'll give you 40, 50, 30, whatever. Yes. And they sometimes give you the radiological impression, but they always put sometimes U2, sometimes U3. U is ultrasound impression. Right, so this is just to, to highlight. Don't don't be linked to the 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 history. But one one thing is I I I do find the people always missing in the thyroid is is that okay? Some of you might look at this and will say, well, I I don't define these cells. I don't know what they are. There are some macrophages here in the background. An actual fact, there are a lot of these macrophages. And then the, uh, these groups, I'm just going to try to find a better field that we, and look, we have there some of these dispersed follicular cells as well, which you are able to see in the background. Okay, so this is a good example, which can, or tends to come in the exam as well. And there are some more follicular cells here. I'm just uh, trying to move through while I'm talking. So you, you um, are able, to uh, to to see what I'm seeing as well, and so some of these fol uh, epithelial or follicular epithelial cells is obviously showing the the what you would like to call it hertel cell morphology sometimes yes or or hertel or oncocytic appearance, but um, not many of them but they can be many, okay. But what I'm trying to tell you or to teach you one thing yes into this line. The only way, the only way, okay, there is another group here of epithelial cells. You can see it now in the middle of the field. Okay, so the only way to be able to diagnose this condition is to always remember that this is going to come in the exam. 
Okay, and if you know that's going to come the, in the exam, then the entire cell, the entire spectrum of things become easy. Right, so what do we have? What we have here actually is that you have a, a, a very cellular aspirate. It has got some follicular epithelial groups, some oncocytic cells, some other cells which looks a little bit plasma cytoid, and some proper plasma cells. And you also have some aggregates of lymphoid cells, which are kind of squashed. Now, there is one rule I always tell to my, my registrars and trainee, and I, I would like you to remember this now and apply it for the exam, okay? I'm not changing your technique. But if you see a lot of lymphoid cells in the background and you wanted to know if the, these are going to be part of a, a, a thyroiditis, or is it just because the specimen is blood stained? Okay. Now, if it is heavily blood stained, yes, you will see a lot of lymphocytes in the background. But number one, you don't have a lot of neutrophils. Can you see that polymorphs in the middle of the field now? Yes, but you don't have, when you go to other areas in the field, you don't have a lot of polymorphs among the lymphocytes in the background. Number two, that the in the cytology, the lymphocytes, when, if they are coming from a tissue origin, like i.e. from the thyroid gland, they will smear. They smear like what you get with the small cell carcinoma. Okay, so that smearing artifact that you see in the middle of the field now, this is what we call it, uh, the, 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 this is, the must be, these cells must be, uh, 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 tissue-driven lymphocytes, okay? They cannot be blood-driven. The blood-driven one, they don't smear, and if they smear, will be one or two, not six or five, is six or seven in one field. So that will, will not happen at all, okay? The other things as well <clears throat> that I find people struggling with to identify what is lymphoid follicles are, okay? All of what I see here is our lymphoid follicles. Some of them are large, some of them are small, okay? But all these aggregates, for me, they are lymphoid follicles. Lymphoid follicles, when they are tissue driven, they look a little bit, they do look, they do look a little bit different from the, 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 the aspirate that you can get from a lymph node because the gets, the, 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 the tends to be a little bit more clumped in this fluid cytology here. So just, just to get used to the fact of these clumps of lymphocytes, which you, if you're lucky, you might find the tangible body macrophages within them, but these clumps are lymphoid aggregates or lymphoid follicles. And then subsequently, they will give you this diagnosis. Yes, you see Hertel cells, how many? It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. Some people, when they see a little bit, a lot of Hertel cells in the background of thyroiditis, they worry about it. In actual fact, I was in a conference in the US CAP, and in US CAP in America, they do say, in order to be able to diagnose the Hertel cell neoplasm, you need to have more than 85%. And some people argued in the meeting and said, no, I will only diagnose it if more than 90% or 95% of the cells are oncocytic cells. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, give me, so, so this is an important aspect of the spectrum. The things is you, then you search for your multinucleated giant cells. And then the, the other things which also keep, um, keep uh, you uh, uh, alert a little bit. And as I told you in the middle of the showing the slide earlier, that you do have a proper plasma cells with perinuclear half which is the, uh, the clock phase if you have a good prep. But what it is, the perinuclear half will be there and the plasma, plasma, uh, plasma lymphocytic background is not a background that you see except in lymphocytic thyroiditis. So what, I, what, what it is important, and it is a paramount important here, that you have to put three things into the back of your mind when you enter into the exam station Number one is, uh, would, I, would, I, would I want it to, to diagnose um, uh, lymphocytic thyroiditis as 5 3 
or is it Thai uh, too? No, as we discussed now, this uh, is a, a, um, a Thai two category. Uh, and uh, please don't, whatever you were discussing in your, uh, with your consultants or you've been taught by whoever was teaching you in the exam, thyroiditis, lymphocytic thyroiditis is this. The parameters of diagnosing lymphocytic thyroiditis are, you see the Hertel cells in the background, you see a lymphocyte reach, you see the nuclear smearing, you see multinucleated giant cells, which you can also see in papillary, by the way. Okay, you see lymphohistiocytic group. Okay, so you will see some lymphohistiocytic group and you see lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate in the background. It doesn't matter how much of the Hertel cell populations you will see. Okay, so let's move on to another case. So we are still in the thyroid and this is the third scenario that we talked about that might come and pop up in the exam. And by finishing this scenario, I will, I will, which I will not discuss is the, the benign one, the Thai 2, because the Thai 2 is abandoned colloid, some groups, despite the cellularity, but <clears throat> they are honeycombing and they are small. Just look into the normal thyroid book, textbook, and you will see what I mean by a small cell. Because as I said, uh, uh, <clears throat> A granuloma in thyroid, you don't want a granuloma. What, why, why you're mentioning? So some people asking granuloma as a thigh two, granulometer thigh two, no. <clears throat> so with the, I just remember the scenarios, we, I'm very specific now, okay? The scenarios in the exam are the thigh two, the thigh three F, and the, the papillary carcinoma, and the thyroiditis. Okay, there is no granuloma thyroid in the exam. Okay, so forget about this now, right? This is don't in the exam is targeting the common cases that people see every day in their practice. You might not see it because you might not be a soft tissue pathologist, but in my exam, for example, what happened is that I had a nodular fasciitis. Yes, so after studying the entire soft tissue for, for a good number of years, I was examined on a nodular fasciitis. Yes, nodular fasciitis is not a common setting in the district general hospital or in the general practice of pathology, okay? You don't see that case every day, but in the soft tissue institute, they see this case at least tw twice a week, right? This is how common that case can be in the soft tissue setting. What I'm trying to say that the exam is targeting the common cases for the particular speciality. So in the thyroid is the same. Okay, so let's, let's target this, uh, this now. This, this, this is um, an interesting case uh, because what you, you need to identify is the Hertel cell morphology or the oncocytic morphology. And what I find people sometimes struggle is when they start to form these groups, complexity, people are very passionate about the papillary architecture. But I told you a minute ago, the papillary architecture I, I just one second. Are you able to hear me quite clear? Because I have a problem with the sound. Okay, very good. Right, so, so what I am trying to say here into this, that if you, you know, papillary group, we, we talked about it a minute ago now. In order to judge a papillary group, you have to have the nuclear crowding and overlapping within it. And you have to have, um, the, the little bit of some sharp anatomical border somewhere. You cannot, a papillary group can happen in, in, in a follicular neoplasm, and it can happen as a papillary hyperplasia, even in a thigh two category. But it is about the cells. Are the cells are enlarged? Are the cells looking more ovoid? All of these sort of things can come into the equation and they will add on. <clears throat> the other things as well that the, the Hertel cell, uh, 
not not like the the thyroid uh, the, the the papillary cells they tend to lie a little bit eccentric you see they tend to have these eccentric positions within the cell and you don't see that you can see it in the papillary oncocytic variant but this is not going to come in the exam so in the exam if you're getting an oncocytic group it is this guy and and it is the hertel uh, cell morphology the things which you will struggle about the can you see the predominance of the population okay and the exam will be exactly the same if you are to get a hertel cell adenoma the 53f slash carcinoma of course i mean suspicious for hertel cell neoplasm uh, or follicular neoplasm with oncocytic feature this is what how you want to use the terminology then what you tend to have, yes, there are microfollicles like that guy, which I put just in the middle of the field now. So you can see a few microfollicles are just sitting next to each other. But sometimes you might struggle, you know, like this group in the middle of the field now, you will struggle to see a microfollicle. Okay, so that's fine. It doesn't stop you from calling it. The other things as well that you will see nucleolus, but the nucleolus tends to be uh, more. Of, uh, of, of, of a central location. And you, you might struggle with the death quick to see a nucleolus. And I agree with you, it is, can be struggled, but if you are a very good cytopathologist, you will be able to see, even in the middle of the field, which I am projecting now, that some cells has got this central uh, nucleolus. But one thing, uh, you can get grooves, you are allowed to get grooves into the, uh, the, uh, the cells. One thing you, you will notice in the follicular population, which doesn't tend to happen a lot into, um, uh, the, 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 in, in the papillary uh, uh, carcinoma, is the variation of nuclear sizes, okay? So you can see that some nuclei are really big, some nucle nuclei are, are smaller and they are just sitting, you know, they are happy to sit very next to each other. It is the, the, the when, when you see, and remember this, when you see a prominent nucleoli that's traveling between every group and the other one, you know, prominent central nucleoli, then that's by definition a Hertel cell neoplasm. So a lot of people, Will, will, will use this as a very strong features for this. Now, what, what I, what I uh, wanted to say, the, the, the terminology of the, the, the college is the one that you wanted to use. And if you go again to the college document, it's not a big one, the cytopathology, it's about two page, two, eight, two and a half pages. It is telling you the thy 3 f is suspicious for follicular neoplasm, okay? So if, if either you put suspicious for follicular neoplasm with Hertel cell morphology or suspicious for follicular neoplasm with oncocytic morphology, this is what you say, but you don't favor a follicular neoplasm, use the terminology that the college is telling us. The college said use suspicious for follicular neoplasm because there is nothing to stop this from being a full, an adenomatous adenoma with, with uh, Hertel cell metaplasia. This can be a, a, an adenoma, uh, sorry, an adenomatous nodule with, her, with the predominance of Hertel cell on the histology. So to call it neoplasm on cytology, then that won't be correct. You call it suspicious for follicular neoplasm. Okay, because that is the terminology that the college have said that we can use. Okay, but this is just to show you, don't be fooled by the architecture, the papillary architecture, because you can see papillary architecture here, you can see microfollicles, you can see individually dispersed cells, but it is the, the cell morphology was wrong. The cells are round, you know, not particularly ovoid. Okay, so these cells are round cells. These cells are still bigger in shape. The cytoplasm are more homogeneous, but this nucleus, the nucleolus is central and it's slightly big. In the thyroid, in the follicular, uh, so in the papillary carcinoma, in the papillary carcinoma, when you get a nucleolus, it is eccentric and it is punctate and it is small, right? 
and you don't just take the groups alone. Nuclear details are better in the exam case to look into it in the pap stain slide. Yes, so in the pap smear, please use it for your, uh, in your exam because it will help you a lot to, to see the nuclear groups and the, the nuclear inclusion. Um, uh, yes, the prominent nucleoli that goes between every single cell and the other, that prominent central nucleoli is not a feature, cytological features. And when you put the pap stain slide, you will be able to see the, the, um, the, uh, the features uh, proper. And if I, um, to answer this, I will um, uh, take you very quickly through this case, but remember, remember that uh, your, your, um, your uh, uh, medullary uh, carcinoma, it does, it's not an exam case, right? I once asked the chief examiner, okay, and focus on this. I asked the chief examiner uh, three months before my exam because I was attending a teaching session that he, or, uh, he was giving. And then I asked him and I said, I have a lot of difficulty in mucoepidermoid carcinoma diagnosis on cytology. Okay, and then he said, well, uh, Ahmed, listen, this is a very rare tumor to see in uh, real life, okay? It is rare, it is one of the, it is not really a very common, you don't see mucopyramoid carcinoma every day. Yes, you might, if you are lucky and working in a busy institute, you see like 12 cases in a year, okay? So it is rare, okay? And to get cytology material, from an aspirate thyroid mucopidermoid that we can distribute it along the eight centers of the exam because the slides of cytology has to be identical, okay? Then this is impossible. And therefore, don't worry about it, okay? And just focus on the main problem. And this is what I also wanted you to highlight. Now, some of you were talking about that I will call her to cell medullary. Okay, but I showed you that they are groups and they are microfollicles. Yes, yes, the, some people can, 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 you see the, the medullary, which you are seeing now in front of the screen, in your screen here, this is a medullary carcinoma. And what you can see that what we call it polymorphic population, polymorphic, P-O-L-Y, not pleomorphic, yes, polymorphic. And what we mean by polymorphic is, that you have a cells that looks a little bit plasma cytoid with a dense cytoplasm. Adjacent to it are the same nucleus, but it has got a little bit of a more polygonal cytoplasm, okay? And on the same field, you get a cell that looks a little bit uh, uh, bizarre. And on the same field, you get another cell that looks a little bit like a squamous cells, that cells that I'm putting in the middle of the field now. Okay, so, and it is a more of a dispersed population. And it is more of, of, of um, you get a lot of these bizarre cells. Can you see this very large cell that has been stripped of its cytoplasm? You tend to get this as well a lot in the medullary carcinoma. So plasma cytoid morphology. Uh, 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 the, the cytoplasm of, of a different textures around, the, some of the cells trying to be stripped of their cytoplasm, which is not a feature that you will ever see in a heritage cell population. The bizarre cell morphology, you will never ever, you can get a, a groups, but you will never get a, uh, uh, an inclusion into the medullary like what you get in the heart cell population. But what it is, the key, of course, the salt and pepper chromatin, which you will see in the, the, uh, 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 in the pap stain slide, but the key really is the polymorphous population. Yes, the nucleus probably looks the same intensity, but the shape of the cells are different. 
and we are happy to sit with each other. And there is no predominance of this microfollicle population. Look, whenever I go into any other group, the same rules apply, okay? The same rule apply. Yes, you have a little bit of some cells now start to become ovoid. This will tend to become spindly later. Uh, and you might get spindly populations within it. Uh, the bizarre cells, look how they are stripped of this nucleus. So let's, uh, let's just move on, okay? But re just remember, remember that rule uh, so you don't tend to forget it. Now, I will leave the thyroid gland and I wanted to go to another case, um, which I, uh, I, I uh, selected because I wanted you to, to apply some rules and criteria into that as well. So we will move now to the pancreas, okay? The pancreas must come so it's either a pancreas or biliary brush right the history the 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 findings are more or less will be the same okay so let me just put the case uh, into the field here and see how we will be able to apply this um let me just to see um if that's the case I selected or not. So just hold with me for uh, five seconds. And a plastic carcinoma will not come in the exam, thank you. Okay. So let's just, uh, the, the, the reason why the exam is like this, because they want you to tell me something. How, who will diagnose anaplastic without doing immuno even on a histology? You don't, because anaplastic, when you see a lot of uh, bizarre cells and, uh, and the very uh, typical cells that's predominantly taking your uh, field, then you will uh, start talking about uh, uh, metastasis, primary versus secondary. And in the primary, you will include medullary carcinoma and anaplastic carcinoma, when it's all very pleomorphic and bizarre, and in the secondary, anything, okay? But anaplastic carcinoma uh, usually if it comes you cannot call it anaplastic carcinoma if it ever comes you say this is a malignant thyroid asper okay so that's a thigh five and then you tell me you say uh, my differential diagnosis is between primary thyroid malignancy and secondary thyroid malignancy primary thyroid malignancy will include uh, 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 follicular carcinoma, medullary carcinoma, and anaplastic may be favoring the, 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 the anaplastic. And the, the second differential will be immuno. And I, if I have a cell block, I might do some immuno stain to see if it is primary or secondary. And what you can do, you can do, of course, the TTF1 and PAX8 and thioglobulin and the calcitonin. Okay, so these are your four parameters of immuno that you might use to be able to differentiate this from anything else. Okay, this now is a, an interesting case and this is a, a, a pancreas. Okay, so this is a pancreas. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, you, we've been all taught that in the pancreas, you have to define the background cells and make them your standard. And after that, you start to search for the other abnormal cells in the background, okay? This is what we know of. But let me, let me just uh, focus with you on a, a few rules here into the pancreas. Now, are you familiar? with what we call it, the Papinicolo Society of uh, uh, the Classifications of Pancreatic Cytology. For those who are familiar, don't say yes. For those who are not familiar, please tell me I've never heard of it. Okay? So, if you have never heard of it, please let me know now. The Papinicolo Society of Pancreatic Cobiliary Cytology Classification which came into the market about three years or three and a half years ago. Did you hear, hear of that classification? How we, 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 okay. So some of you have never heard of it. Some of you have, have heard of it, okay. 
now it doesn't matter if you heard of it or not okay what i wanted but what i wanted you to understand now that this is the way the college expecting you to report but don't panic i will tell you in the next five minutes what you need to know out of it and it does match what you've learned about the pancreatic cytology okay now you've seen a lot of groups here in the background let's start by this slide first and then we will go to the classification in a minute okay so i'm just going through this now as you can see and then these are what you some of you are very eager to say the honeycombing group yes like ductal cells, whatever they are, yes, but these are your reference cells, is that correct? <clears throat> are we in agreement? Yes, okay, video epithelium, ductal cells, whatever, it depends on the methods, right? Because if it's a CT guided, then you will call those ductal. If it was, in, uh, if they got this uh, through an endoscopic or ultrasound approach, then this can be a sheet of, uh, glandular uh, mucosa, then if you call them uniform glandular mucosa, ductal or glandular, you will be accepted. So don't struggle with how you will call it, yes? Because if it was a CT guided, you cannot call it biliary epithelium, yes? But what you can say, uniform glandular mucosa, that's absolutely fine and that's acceptable, okay? But what you need to appreciate into this is the background. And the background doesn't look right. The first thing is that there are a lot of inflammatory cells that's quite dispersed into this background. The second thing, you remember now the background, I'm very, very uh, uh, passionate about it. The second thing that which you can appreciate in the background that there are these very degenerate cells and they are what we call it a dirtiness of the background right this dirty background you should not allow it to happen and then you go to another groups yes there are a little bit of some line of palisading but these are more jumbled up now so now you are moving to another spectrum which can be reactive atypia of some sort yes so we agree so far on these parameters and we are happy with those but we started to go to some other groups which you start to see what we call it tumor diathesis in behind it. And what I also started to see is these uh, streaks, which are quite kind of like the streaks which we saw in the last lecture of the mucoid material, which I don't allow. And then look, you start to get these individual cells in the middle of the field which are looking very bizarre, prominent irregular nucleolus and the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio is high and the nucleus is nearly and utterly adherent to the cell membrane. You know, these cells, I will not discard them as, as, a, as, a, as a benign. And then you keep searching and you will every time you search more away from these uniform groups you start to see more of these cells which start to become a little bit more hyperchromatic the groups are becoming a little bit more irregular and even in a group like here you don't see the actual clusters because that's out of focus but you see the cells that's coming out of it and you see that these cells are abnormal the nucleus is big the nuclear, the nuclear boundaries are irregular and more importantly, and this is a very crucial finding in the pancreatic cytology, is the fact that these cells are discohesive, okay? They are coming out of these groups, which is not a phenomena that I will leave it like, look again, I'm showing you the discohesion within the group. The variation of nuclear sizes is your number one. If I say, number two which is the point that i mentioned about the discohesion but your number one is that variation within the single group okay and what people say and the classification say that if you have a variation of nuclear sizes 
within the single group of one to four, right? Like the one cell is four times bigger than the other cells next to it. And they are all malignant, you know, the, even if you don't think they are malignant or you're not sure, but that one to four ratio is diagnostic and utterly diagnostic for a carcinoma based on the new classification. So what is that classification that I'm going around? So I am not going to waste your time, but I will just remind you for those who knows and for those who don't know with what is that classification is. And I will uh, just uh, quickly, I, this, is, this is what the classification looks like. You don't need to read it. There is a paper. If you take the name of the book and you put it on the, pay, on the Google search for the paper, they published a paper that went out with the book for the summary of the entire book. The book is basically relying on um, the, the, the new classification is this, okay? So it is either non-diagnostic, category one, or negative, or atypical, which will have two main things inside it. The reactive atypia, that you see that cells are a little bit hyperchromatic, jumbled up, but there, aren't the, there, is no, there are no discohesion and there are no um, uh, this variation of nuclear sizes which we talked about, okay? The other one is benign, like the, the pancreatic uh, solid uh, papillary, like the mucinous uh, uh, cyst adenoma, these two sort of things. And there are then others like new endocrine carcinoma, which is another category, but the two category which you proper or the three category which you are you trying to use in the exam are number one is the atypical category. And in order to know the atypical category, you need first to know if you have a, the, you need to know the category six and category five. Okay, so if you know category six and category five, then you will know the entire uh, uh, things. Now, if you have never read this classification, I will only, because you only have five or six days, just download the paper, right? Download the paper and then you will be able to read it. If you don't have access to the paper, send me an email and then I will send you the paper, okay? So, I, I am happy to send you the paper via email, but uh, and then you will be absolutely fine. So what I wanted to take you, I will take you directly to the category uh, 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 six, and I want you to understand why the college has put category, uh, not the college, the Papinocolo Society, which is European American now, but this is adopted in England and in the entire Europe. Okay, and. Uh, I just will take you to the, the um, uh, category, which we call it um, the, the, uh, the malignant category, okay? Which is the, um, the positive for carcinoma, okay? So this is category six, the positive for carcinoma. Uh, yes, that's the email. I just sent you the email or which you can send to me to get the paper, yes, on the chat link. So let's focus, positive or malignant, yes? Okay, so let's go to the criteria, the diagnostic criteria uh, directly, because this is what is what matters, okay? So the diagnostic criteria, let's stay by the ductal, because this is what we are concerned about. Um, here is the criteria, yes? Okay, so the criteria for ductal carcinoma or cholangiocarcinoma. Okay, I told you this classification can be used for both. Right? Number one, variability. Variability of uh, the cells with the predominance of one types. But we, I don't, I'm not going to go through the well differentiated. Sorry, let me just go to the moderate or poorly differentiated because this is your example which will come in the exam, okay? So we will go to the criteria, the diagnostic criteria. So here they wanted you to see 
large cellular sheet fragment with increased amount of single cells, yes? So what they mean by this, you will see clusters, three-dimensional clusters, but you will also see single cells in the background. Number two, you get the more extensive cellular pleomorphism. So what does that, that mean? That what does that, that mean? That whatever you applied before into your criteria, like what you said, nuclear irregularities, uh, uh, coarse chromatin, you know, the APC of pathology for pleomorphism, you apply it, okay? Marked anisonucleosis and occasional prominent nucleoli, okay? So you get variation in the shape and the size of the nucleoli. More crowded three-dimensional groups, okay? And as you move on to the more, uh, um, you get significant populations of single or large cells. You get higher nuclear cytoplasmic ratio and you get a, a prominent, you can get karyorexes and necrosis like what we saw in the background of these cells. It doesn't matter, as you saw into that example, which we have seen how much uh, it, it, it difference that will make. What it does matter is, is what I wanted you to remember is that it, it is, um, the, 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 what it matters is that you know the difference between uh, what is, it, you know, you need to apply a very fine nuclear details, the, the pleomorphism, yes, but the pleomorphism will be present in the atypical group in the structure or in the instrumental, or if you have a stent, you will have all this hyperchromasia, you will have nucleoli, you will have uh, some increase in the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, you, you might have some degenerate features with irregular nuclear outlines, but there are two features. They are very important. Okay, and this will have the, the, the discohesion of the group and the variation of nuclear sizes of, of NC ratio of one to four. And why, why I am mentioning this? Why, why do I keep stressing on this? Because this is the difference between the new classification and the suspicious for malignancy. Okay. And what it means, the, class, the, the definition of suspicious form malignancy is that it is a category that you don't, you have some of the criteria, but not all of it. You have some of the diagnostic criteria, but not all of it. But what does that mean? How much is enough? Okay, how much is enough is to do with the nuclear size? And I will take you here, okay? Let's read this paragraph together for those who has know about it or they don't know about it. The paragraph that's highlighted, okay? Specimen described as suspicious for malignancy as characterized by significant anisonucleosis. A three-fold or greater variation in nuclear sizes within any single cell clusters is characteristics of this specimen, okay? So this feature, the new classification, are using it to diagnose the uh, category as malignant. And if you start to see one to four, one to five, then you are definitely malignant. If you are one to three, you are benign. If you are less than that, then question yourself again uh, into this category. And this is what I wanted to highlight. So don't bother about it, but remember that in the exam, you are allowed to use one of two categories. If you can use the suspicious for, for, for a malignancy, that's absolutely fine. Or you can use the other category, which we call it the, uh, the malignant, proper malignant, suspected adenocarcinoma, okay? Or consistent with adenocarcinoma. The difference in the new classification, which you have to be aware of, and you have to mention this if you use the suspicious terminology, that that means that you need a further or additional investigation. Okay, so if you need an additional investigation, 
then that like basically you need now to to have a, a, a visualization of tumor with MRI and the, you are not giving them the license to go directly to do the, the cancer treatment. And this is when you will use suspicious. So in the exam, I prefer and I strongly urge you, if you see that there is a discohesion and you see there is a variation within that cluster, that particular one group of cells of one to four in nuclear sizes, then ideally what I would like you to do is to call it, this is a malignant aspirin. Now, your other counterpart will be the atypia, and this is when you see a lot of acute and chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate, and you saw some groups with hyperchromasia, picket fencing, but they are not discohesive, and there is no that wide variation of nuclear sizes, not an isonucleosis, and then go for atypia. The most difficult cases in the exam is this one. The problem is that you, it will be a shame that you lose your exam based on this case, which has got only two scenarios, only two, okay? It is between atypia or, and between the, the malignant uh, counterpart. So don't stay on the borderline, and remember that now suspicious is a different category. In our mind, it is a different category. Uh, no, they shouldn't, okay? What will happen in the exam? That you will get the proper malignant. The reason why, the, the, if, if I don't want to waste a lot of your time, but because you raised this question, I need to complete the information. The reason why suspicious for malignancy category was created because as you know, we get in the pancreas, what we call it IPMN, yes? Which is the precursors for the cancer. And when you, when you sample the duct, it might be only an IPMN. And IPMN can present with a severe dysplasia, okay? And therefore, under the suspicious of malignancy, IPMN come into the category. So the last thing that you want is a patient to have a, a Whipple's operation and, which, and die, and then the pathology come to, 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 to the pathology report come and say, oh, this was only IPMN. So we killed the patients and, um, um, and then, uh, and then you, you see the best terminology for atypia that you are saying, you say this category. You see, the category is, which we said in the contents, uh, the category three atypical, and you put the name of the classification. No one on earth can stand against this, okay? If you are going for the atypia, but then you say, I favor this to be a reactive uh, atypia related to the stenting uh, process or related to uh, inflammation of pancreatitis or whatever it is, whatever where the setting is, yes? So, but if you put the Papinocolo Society system, category three atypia, this is the terminology that I would recommend that you use, providing that in the next line, you are telling me which one you will be using in the exam. Okay, so which one you favored, like atypia reactive? or you atypia you don't know, okay? Because there will be in real life situation atypia you don't know, but in the exam, if you are leaning more towards atypia, you are probably leaning towards atypia reactive because you excluded all the rules which we talked about for the definite malignancy. You will not get the suspicious for malignancy. So you are in between the malignancy category and you are between this category three, the atypia, and you need to, make up your mind, try to find some music, try to find this degree of atypia that we talked about, the tumor, diathesis, all of those things which should be helpful and should work for this case, okay? As you know, I cannot, and there is no one can, cover the entire things for the exam in one hour, and uh, we, we, unfortunately, again, we have to stop here but we have, I hope that this was useful. 
Yes, so the case which I showed was a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Uh, we don't tend to, I don't tend to classify it into a sen asana or, uh, or, or, or uh, but I just say consistent with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So I don't tend to, to uh, try to categorize it any further. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, you can always uh, send it to me on an email. Uh, the, the, there are three, before I, sh I close the session, <clears throat> there are three classifications which you need to be aware of that the college are now teaching to their trainee. This is the second one, which I just projected on the screen now, which is the Milan system for reporting salivary gland cytopathology. And you ne just need to know it is, it is how, we w how it, it will work out in the middle category, in something that we call it a neoplasm of undetermined significance. Okay, so just, just only get, that, get the paper as well. So they have a paper for it. And just to go through the, 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 this middle category, the, uh, the, the undetermined significance, because this is a case that comes in the exam a lot. And in the borderline category, I told you, you will not get a borderline in urine cytology. You will not get a borderline in any other cytology, except in the salivary gland for the basaloid tumor, right? So the basaloid tumor scenario where you don't know if it is a basal cell aden uh, adenoma uh, slash adenocarcinoma, basal uh, adenoid cystic tumor, or cellular pleomorphic adenoma. It is a very common scenario. I'm sure you have seen it in a lot of courses and a lot of books and a lot of examples. This example is the only borderline example that will come in the exam. And in the salivary gland, you have two situations that you will face. Situation number one, that they call you an aspirate from a neck lump with a lot of squamous cells and one or two clusters of hair tail cells. And everyone, 90% of the people call it metastatic squamous cell carcinoma, while in actual fact, it's a wartrans from the tail of the parotid you might say that was deceiving because you said it is a neck aspirate. Yes, and this is what the history came with. The radiologist cannot differentiate between the tail of the parotid and the neck node level two. And they will send tell, tell you this is a neck aspirate. So you look at it, you think it's a lymph node, a lot of squamous cells, you call it this, but that's wrong. The second scenario, this is not a metastatic SCC, this is a Wharton's, right? The second scenario is the scenario of that basaloid tumor that you need to open the differential between pleomorphic and uh, adenoma and uh, uh, cellular pleomorphic adenoma, adenoid cystic and basal cell adenoma. And that is the scenario that does come a lot in the exam. And I mean a lot. Like every other exam, if they are to bring this scenario, they will bring it because they want to fail the people on this. They want someone to call it either malignant or someone to call it completely benign. And they forget that there are the area of difficulty, which is the commonest in any saliva gland aspirate. This is not a rare occurrence. That's the commonest occurrence to get a basaloid groups with a little bit of stroma and you don't know how I'm going to work it out. Unfortunately, to be able to tell you the difference, that would take me at least an hour between the three, but for now, just practice on how you do that. Now, the third classification is this one, the Paris classification. You need to be aware of this, okay? There is no way you will enter the exam without knowing what the Paris system for reporting cytology is, and you must use it in the exam. There is no other way now. There is the, and the one, uh, there is one thing out of this classification don't to use is the low-grade urothelial carcinoma. So ignore the low-grade urothelial carcinoma for now, but if you see an instrumental sample 
that has got a lot of cluster that looks papilloid, then say this may be an instrumental sample. However, low grade carcinoma cannot be excluded, and this has to be correlated with the site with the cystoscopy. The reason why in the United Kingdom we are not bothered about the low grade urothelial carcinoma because the low grade urothelial carcinoma are all papillary carcinoma. So when they examine it with the cystoscopy, they see it. And then they don't have to send you samples because they, instead of sending you the sample of this papillary gross urine cytology, they take it out. Okay, this is different from the high grade. The high grade, sometimes they see it as ulcer or as a, as a patch. So they, do, they are not sure. And this is why they will send the cytology. But in the cystoscopy, so they, they see the tumor. So there is no need for them to send you urine cytology for diagnosis. They will excise it straight away. They are not going to leave it till you tell them it's a tumor. They see it in front of them. They know it is tumor. Okay, so this is why, don't worry about low grade, but if you get a sample with a lot of papillary groups that looks benign, just say this, the differential diagnosis here is between instrumental sample. However, a low grade urothelial carcinoma cannot be excluded and correlation with cystoscopy findings should be applied. But again, don't, uh, so, so these are the three main classifications that you should be aware of for the exam. There are papers for each one of them and the, the papers should be uh, uh, like for those who has not prepared the, and never heard of it, they just go and read the paper. So at least you know, uh, you know, you just implement it into what you know. It is not different. What I said about the pancreas is not different. But when you go in depth, yes, it is different. But at the, for the sake of the exam, it isn't. Okay, for the sake of the exam, it is not. I hope that you did find that session useful. And, um, and uh, uh, please, please, what I will do, I am just uh, in the final, final, final part of doing the OSPI uh, lecture, which I will record it. And I will put it for you online, either, I think by tomorrow. Okay, so by tomorrow, hopefully, I will put the OSPI. It is a PowerPoint presentation narrated with my, with my explanation. And you will find that this will be uh, very good. Um, the, 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 uh, the clues for instrumental, any, anything with a benign urothelial group that looks papillary, you will call it instrumental but you just add the sentence for a uh, low grade cannot be excluded and correlate with the cystoscopy. Okay, but any, any groups with benign architecture, it is instrumental. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm sorry that I woke you up early this morning, uh, but you still have the rest of the day. You can go and rest and uh, enjoy your time and enjoy your families. And uh, thank you very much for tuning in and listening. Thank you.